keeping the in lils of the world awake by reason of our babble here at the uh, Snake Bros Institute for Advanced Copper Light Studies, where there are no degrees, only certificates of ignorance and large cups of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it's 12.30 a.m. Yeah. I've been it's up the, for a long time. It's the next day, yeah. Yep, long day at work. I just want to read articles and not do anything else. <laughs> just kind of read. I can't think right now. Come on, man. We got to keep these people awake. <laughs> They're working right now. Oh, shit. <laughs> He's a dummy. Watch the road. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I just found this one. Um, I had bookmarked a while back. It's from smithsonian.com. Um, May 15th. The teeth of early Neanderthals may indicate the species' lineage is older than thought. Some of the oldest known Neanderthal remains include teeth that could push back the split with modern human lineages, but not all scientists are convinced. In a cave called the Pit of Bones, Pit of Bones, up in the Atapuerca Mountains of Spain, a collection of 430,000-year-old teeth are curiously smaller than might be expected for the skulls they were found with. The anomaly has one scientist suggesting that the lineages of modern humans and Neanderthals split some 800,000 years ago, tens of thousands of years earlier than genetic studies have estimated. Ada Gomez Robles, an anthropologist at University College London, studies how ancient hominin species' teeth evolved over the ages. She believes that because the ancient teeth look too modern for their era, they must have evolved unusually quick or, as she finds more likely, had more time to evolve than has been generally believed. The new research was published today in Science Advances. As various hominin species evolved, their teeth changed in notable ways, generally becoming smaller over time. Studying the teeth of various early human ancestors is one of the most common ways of differentiating between species and even identifying new ones. Gomez Robles's previous research suggests that teeth tend to evolve at a relatively standard rate across hominin history. If that's true, the molars and premolars unearthed from the Spanish cave are smaller than would be expected given their age. Quote, When we look at these teeth... They are very similar to the teeth of later Neanderthals, even though they are much older, in quote. Uh, Gomez Robles says, In this study, we've tried to examine the amount of time that these early Neanderthals would have needed to evolve this dental shape, which is so much like the dental shape of Neanderthals that are much later, in quote. Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are, uh, share a common ancestor, but exactly who that species was and when their later lineages diverged from it is a difficult mystery to untangle. But there are clues, and the new tooth study is far from the first evidence to emerge even from Cima de los Huesos, Huesos the fossil-rich cave site in Spain's Atapuerca Mountains. The hominins who lived here, some 30 individuals who've been well studied over the years, appear from their morphology and DNA to be early Neanderthals. In fact, the remains represent some of the oldest known Neanderthals. But how close were they really to the common ancestor of both that... Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> but how close were they really to the common ancestor of both that vanished species and our own? Uh, Forget of it. both that vanished yeah. species and our own. Yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah, I wasn't going to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Genetics has helped us peer into the past and sketch out the ancient branches of the hominin family tree. A 2016 study of 430,000-year-old Neanderthal remains from the Cima de los Huesos site estimates the time of the Neanderthal split from the Homo sapiens lineage at 550,000 to 765,000 years ago. Other genetic studies similarly suggest divergence times that are less than 800,000 years ago. Paleoanthropologist Rick Potts, director of the Smithsonian's Human, Resor uh, Human Origins Program, <laughs> says that while Gomez Robles raises some plausible ideas, he's far from convinced that rates of dental evolution are as standard or predictable as the paper suggests. She's bitten off an interesting topic here. 
but I just don't see the argument that dental rates of evolution are absolutely known to the point where we can then say that for certain the Neanderthal modern human divergence must have been earlier than 800,000 years ago. Wait, wait. The guy's a paleoanthropologist and his name is Potts? Yep. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Pot says. <laughs> Pot shirts. <laughs> yeah. A variety of molecular genetic studies suggest it's more recent. So he doesn't want to, he didn't want to push it back. Right. It's a pretty long story. Should I keep going? Yeah. It's possible, Gomez Robles says, that the teeth evolved at an unusually high rate due to strong selection for the genetic changes. This accelerated change could have happened if the remote population lived in isolation from Europe's other Neanderthals. But Gomez Robles believes that the teeth simply evolved over a long period of time, which, according to her timeline of dental evolution rates, would put the split between the Homo sapiens and the Neanderthal lineage at 800,000 years ago or older. Quote, everything else, such as the face and the anatomy of these hominins, looks kind of intermediate, Gomez Robles says. They look like what we'd expect for hominins of that age, but the teeth look very, very different. They look very Neanderthal, and the only thing that's different is the teeth. If there was selection, we'd expect that to have an effect on something else, like the face, and not... Okay. <laughs> if yeah. there was selection, we'd expect that to have an effect on something else, like the face, and not just the teeth. Potts also points out several possible causes of misinterpretation including a, ver a variable called generation time that could greatly impact the timeline of dental evolution over many thousands of years. If you have a quicker or a slower pace of development of the teeth, of growth, that would affect your estimation of rates of evolution, he says. Scientists do have evidence that the speed of tooth development change over evolutionary time. Microscopic studies of tooth enamel layers allow researchers to calculate the days between a fossil hominin's birth and the eruption of its first molar, showing that 1.5 million years ago, young Homo erectus got their first molar at around 4.5 years old. By about 200,000 years ago, Neanderthals got the same tooth by around age six, as we humans still do today. Quote, and we don't know when, between 1.5 million years ago and 200,000 years ago, that rate changed to a much slower rate of development of the teeth, Potts says. So that's a lot of wiggle room. Wait a minute. <clears throat> Are they... So do Neanderthals and Homo erectus not have a baby set of teeth? No, it's saying... No, because you get molars even in the baby set of teeth. Right, but so. those are gone. How do you find those from in a, in, a, in a fossil of an adult? Maybe they're finding them in the fossil of the of a child. I guess, maybe. I don't know. Doesn't say. <clears throat> Serious. Uh, we get two sets of teeth from the nefs. I'm gonna have to chew on this story for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Hybridization between different species, which appears to have been rampant during the era, is another possible complication. Mating between the modern human and Neanderthal species occurred as recently as 50,000 years ago. So now, uh, okay, that, that your story was talking about the Denisovans. Yeah. There's all hell breaking loose in interglacial Europe during this time period where there are populations separating from one another for periods of time, probably undergoing fast evolution, coming back together thousands to tens of thousands of years later, Potts says. We don't know what the effect of that evolutionary population's history, dividing and coming back together over and over again during Ice Age and interglacial Europe, would have had on mechanisms of dental evolution. Given the difficulties of untangling different lines of ancient evidence and the rel relatively small differences between genetic and tooth evolution estimates of the modern human Neanderthal split, one might wonder why uncovering the true timeline is so important. But filling in such blanks is the only way we can accurately chart the many evolutionary shoots and branches of our own family tree and learn how we became who we are. Even when the difference is not huge, Gomez Robles says, the implications of those differences can be quite important in terms of understanding the relationships between different species and which ones are ancestral to another. So. Why are smaller teeth a, an evolutionary advantage? That I don't know. 
Maybe uh, your jaw can grow smaller so your brain can get bigger. <laughs> but Neanderthals had bigger brains, so yeah. I don't know. It's but see, okay, we, we talked about I mean, this I before. I know that they argue that it's the food type, but... Well, I was thinking of doesn't the, the... Doesn't the teeth dictate the food type, not the other way around? Yeah, I thought so. But the But also, in terms of size, isn't it like, you know, living in warm or cold climates dictates takes uh, size of body yeah it can or in many cases it does yeah know. yeah so the the basic general idea is the colder it is the like more, when you're looking at mammals right and mammals the colder it is the more massive you want to be in order to, be, to retain your heat right <clears throat> very small mammals have a hard time staying warm in very cold climates yeah so unless you're a rabbit Rabbits can live everywhere. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> you just look, you look like you were trying to scare me. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and cats, actually. Cats, cats can live everywhere there. They can live, they're very versatile, you know. They can live in packs or as solo. Uh, I'm talking about like what we think of as domestic cats now. You mm. know, you see them sometimes in huge herds, right? There'd be a whole bunch of them all together yeah. and they're sort of wild and they just sort of run around as a big herd of cats. But there's also just one one of them could split off and go off and live by, his, by himself and be totally fine. Yeah. You can take them all the way up to the Arctic or all the way down into the jungle of the Amazon and they totally are fine. That's it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. I always wondered, I got a, I got this dark colored cat and like mostly black. Yeah. And it just goes and lays out in the sun. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, 90 degrees. I'm just like, what? yeah. And then it's the middle of winter and he's still laying there. And he's like, this is also great. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I don't really understand the, um, I have questions, you know, and it's, uh, these questions may be answered, but I have questions about the, uh, the whole jaw size and teeth size thing and how that, like, why is it getting smaller over time? You would, actually, you would think that there should be a sort of, that it would follow the, gla if it was really some kind of climate uh, thing. It if it be. was an evolutionary adaptation to current conditions, then you would think you would see this sort of fluctuation, you know, that during warmer times, your teeth and your jaws get smaller because your food is, is easier to get and you're able to get softer. You don't have to eat as, as much rough things because it, you food is more plentiful during an interglacial, right? And then during a glacial period, your teeth and jaw get enormous so that you can chew really difficult yeah. stuff. Yeah. And instead, there's, they think that there's just this linear development of slowly smaller jaw and teeth. Yeah. That And that may just be, that may be an artifact of the sample size. They just don't have very many samples because obviously <clears throat> hominid bones just, they're pretty rare, that old. Yeah. What are we having tonight? <laughs> Tundra and Mammoth Falls. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to chew it. Just... Yeah. Trying to chew <laughs> frozen root balls and stuff yeah. like that. And just, uh, yeah. you know, hard shelled, like the kinds of plants that can survive in that kind of environment have hard shells and just, yeah. and they're, they're very fibrous and, and you know, or, or then you have the thing like, uh, like what we were seeing with the, um, with the <clears throat> the Pueblo people, you know, and it, that that their teeth were like they wouldn't talk to us very much about the remains of the Pueblo. People. Yeah, I tried to ask a couple of times about burial practices and stuff, and the guy was like, "We don't talk about that. It's a sort of a taboo." And I'm like, "Well, I mean, come on, guy, what have you found?" You know. But anyway, they did imply that the teeth of the Pueblo people were sort of ground down to nubs. Yeah, and they think that that's because they did they ground their grains on granite on sandstone and, and granite, sandstone yeah. and granite and you end up with all these little particles of minerals in there and so they're chewing that stuff and it over time grinds their teeth down yeah did you buy that story no <laughs> it seems unlikely but i mean like who you know I, you hand me a bowl of corn and i, I take a bite of it and it's like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. come on guy <laughs> take this back
<laughs> Run it through a strainer. <laughs> yeah, or just find a different type of stone. You can't wash it off? I don't know, yeah. Find a different type of stone. Yeah, I guess you could put it in, in water and the all the stony stuff would fall to the bottom. Yeah, fall to the bottom. And I the just corn would float. Right. Didn't make any sense to me. That's a good point, man. Let's go back there and tell that guy. <laughs> You're wrong. Well, it was the interpretive tour. Right. Remember? Yeah, every tour was interpretive. But yeah, that's probably what the what the uh, what the theory is, though. So, yeah, those boat stones were missing a lot of rock. I mean, yeah. they, but they it were just seems they like were could, hollowed out. It like just boats. seems like you could easily easily wash the minerals out of the out of the plant material because the plant material will float, and the stone dust won't. You know, in most cases, you could just you get it in a bowl or whatever, and you sort of do a little bit of sifting, and all yeah. that stuff would have and would silt to the bottom, and yeah. you would have clean. Yeah, I don't know. I d- it just didn't make s- much sense to me. Yeah. Hmm. But maybe they're so fine that it would just collo- be colloidal or something. I don't know. Just, I don't know. I mean, if you're making flour, a flour is ground pretty fine. And if you have a whole bunch of tiny little rock particles mixed into that, it just seems like maybe they'd be embedded into. The then you wouldn't be of- chewing it because it's like it'd be. T- yeah. Mix it up. Make a shake. Yeah. It's like it comes out in your bread. You know. It's like, what is it? They think it act like sandpaper. Can you really chew something down to where your but teeth... But what would grind their teeth down? Right. Uh, what else would? That's what I... Uh, oh, just... You just eat rocks. <laughs> <laughs> they had a bad case of TMJ. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What would grind their teeth down? Chewing on rocks, yeah. Well, it seems like chewing on things that are difficult to chew on would grind your teeth down. Yeah. But I don't know. I've been I've been chewing on ice cubes my whole life, and my teeth aren't ground down. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> That's crystalline structure right there. <laughs> Makes a cool sound. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder if there. <laughs> I wonder if there are any modern analogs to teeth ground down over time due to diet. Yeah. I don't know. You know, like, can we look at? Uh, is there a place where? This happens now, and so that there's. I'm I'm just asking these questions sort of rhetorically. There are probably answers to them. I'm just wondering, like this whole. The, the, Once the again, te- we don't have the watcher who would probably right. He'd know. be looking this stuff up and being like, "No, yes, no," and here's where it is, and it happens in Tibet. <laughs> uh, but the teeth thing, I've looked at. I've done a lot of research based on teeth because teeth are, in terms of finding hominid uh, remains, teeth are pretty common because they're hard yeah they stick around yeah yeah so you can find a lot of teeth and and the torodont type which is a neanderthal phenotype of tooth or morph- morphological tooth you know has a very specific kind of molar uh and you look at the neanderthal teeth and then you look at a homo sapiens teeth mold the same molar from the same spot in the jaw and the neanderthal tooth is way bigger like i mean like probably twice the size mm-hmm. if not to you know maybe two times the size or whatever. It's just, it's pretty big. And it, and the ones I've seen are not worn down. Yeah. They're worn just like anybody's tooth would be. You know, you use it and it gets worn. Every molar has jagged, a jagged stuff on the top and that stuff slowly gets worn down, but it doesn't get worn down to the jawline. You can't, you couldn't chew if your tooth was worn down that far. You would end up, it would, everything you bit would be hitting the nerves, wouldn't it? At least I, in our teeth. I have teeth. no idea. Yeah, I don't know. That's why people get, when you get a cavity, it gets a hole in there and you get, and, it, and stuff yeah, gets it in and starts poking the nerve. The nerve. Yeah, because there's a nerve in, in every tooth. Maybe if it's slow enough, the nerve, like, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, atrophies. Maybe they're, maybe they're just beaten down. <laughs> <laughs> and they chew so hard because they got these enormous jaw muscles. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems uh, very difficult to me that you could chew, you could, you could grind your teeth down that far and, and have them still be functional. Yeah, I don't know. And I've had teeth problems before, and I, it, I like trying to eat when you have serious dental issues is that's that's a death sentence if you don't have good dental. Yeah, you know or, I mean? or just a sentence to applesauce for life. <laughs> right, which how are you going to get that? <laughs> Smash apples. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, if you live in a period where everyone's teeth are getting worn down because they're having to eat really hard stuff, you don't have a lot of smashed apples lying around. <laughs> it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> Grind those apples up with a with a boat stone. Yeah. <laughs> and just drink it. <laughs> smashed apples. <laughs> And you can boil anything and make it softer. Yeah. Even Except if- rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh. <laughs> Screw that guy. <laughs> He's what? mad that we were laughing. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh. Oh, laugh. that's, God, that reminds me. I did have an email to read <laughs> about that. Tangent. Yeah. I'm not trying not to laugh. <laughs> I'm I'm working on my etiquette here, man. Yeah, well, I am. I'm I was hoping to... he was working on his attitude. I'm working <laughs> on my etiquette. He's not going to work on his attitude, you can tell. <laughs> he totally thinks we're freaking CIA. Okay, so. <laughs> laughing at my own jokes. So we got this email like maybe a day or two after we posted the show where we read the comment from the guy, Indrid War- Lukewarm, who was mad at us for laughing and also thought that we were. Trying to establish stuff. Trying to establish credibility in this community. <laughs> our, our cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this came from Patricia, and she says, I just recommended your podcast to a friend and prefaced my recommendation with, love their maniacal giggles. Don't stop laughing. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you. Thank you. We won't. We aren't. I can't. <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> That's stuff is funny. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's my favorite part about hanging out, having a conversation is making, you know. Yeah. I mean, the, obviously I'm, the content is fascinating and stuff, but, yeah. you know, you got to joke about it. Right. And I joke way less than I want to. You know, all while you're reading that article, I'm thinking of all kinds of stuff <laughs> yeah, I, I know, say, and this. I'm just holding back because I'm like, no, this is this is serious stuff. We need to pay attention. Thing. And I'm trying not, but I had to be like, wait, his name is Potts? <laughs> you know, I had to say that one because it's an acronym, but for the most part, I'm holding back, guy. Yeah. Work on your attitude. Me too. <laughs> holding back all the time. <laughs> all right. So this one was making the rounds and uh, uh, also sent to us by a couple of people. One of them is our good friend at GMA who you may know from uh, previous episodes. So I got, again, from agent-origins.net, but there, this, was, this has been all over the internet. Uh, origin of Greek civilization believed found on monumental pyramid island. So, a new discovery has possibly revealed the origin of ancient Greek culture in a remote and uninhabited pyramid-shaped islet, islet, Archaeologists have found evidence of a rich cultural and monumental landscape dating from earlier than the Minoan period. The evidence so far is that it was a major religious center created with technical knowledge predating that found by, at Minoan Knossos by at least 400 years, indicating that it played a significant role in the development of Greek civilization. The barren islet of Daskalio, God, all these names. I'm having a hard time with the yeah. names today. Why can't they just do archaeology in America so I can read all the names? <laughs> <laughs> they need to start just doing archaeology in America so I can understand how to say the names. Okay, so the barren island of Daskalio lies just off the coast of the island of Karos, which is one of the Cyclades islands in the Aegean Sea and was once part of Karos before sea levels rose. Daskalio has been the subject of intense archaeological investigation since 2015 when an undisturbed site was located. The research is being carried out by a multinational team supported by the Greek government and the British school in Athens. The large-scale project is being funded by several international institutes. The project is led by Colin Rinfrew and Michael Boyd and has found the earliest truly monumental complex of buildings ever unearthed anywhere in the Greek world, reports The Independent. The islet had a settlement with metalworking shops, buildings, and even indoor plumbing, and all of this a millennium before the Minoans, who are often thought of as the first European civilization. According to the Keep Talking Greece website, the team of archaeologists have uncovered a complex, stratified, and technically expert society. Daskalio has a distinctive pyramid shape, which is due to the extensive engineering activities of the ancient people of the Aegean Islands. They deliberately exaggerated the pyramidal shape of the rocky outcrop 
by creating a number of huge terraces on Daskalio that measured in total about 1,000 feet. There were six terraces, and upon them were built a number of buildings, mostly in marble. Some of the buildings were two floors and had staircases and were built using marble, they say again. <laughs> <laughs> the cultural landscape was built within a four-decade period and based on a single design. Wow. Built within 40 years and all based. So it's very, uh, like everything was pre-planned. Right. Yep. Burgeoning civilization. Hey, guys. Yeah. I have a master plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> civilization begins. Yeah. The complex has been dated to about 4,600 years ago. It is believed that the Pyramid Island was a religious site that attracted pilgrims from far and wide who buried small statues here as sacrifices to unknown deities. Hmm. How do they know they were burying them to deities if they're unknown? Yeah. The summit of the pyramid islet was... And how is it a sacrifice if it's a statue? <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time to make a statue and then you just bury yeah, it in Yeah, I hole. guess that's true. It's the sacrifice of the work to make the statue? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I, the whole thing about statues being buried, especially if they're buried upside down with a, with a bunch of burnt stuff, I'm like, that was something else. Yeah, magic. Yeah. Or Religious Erasing practices. like those Olmec heads were all buried in deep pits upside down with not all of them, but a lot of them. The summit of the Pyramid Islet was an open area possibly used for sacrifices or votive offerings. The identity of the gods that were worshipped here is unknown. There is no arable land on the rocky outcrop and little on Keros. Therefore, the inhabitants of ancient Daskalio may have depended on religious pilgrims and also engaged in trade. Keep Talking Greece uh, website reports that archaeological finds indicate that the settlers' trade extended over a wide network re uh, reaching beyond the Cyclades. I think that's how you say that. There is evidence that the inhabitants specialized in metallurgy, and they may have traded their metal products for food and other goods. So it was like a... It was a it was metal like a factory or something. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's a, if, you, if you see one giant thing pre-built with the... With Housing built in, and you think this is a factory. Yeah. You know? A religious factory. Right. <laughs> Where you make metal objects for people to come and you bury your statue right there, and you can have this sword. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, yeah. Such a huge complex required a great deal of labor and organization, especially to bring the marble from the quarries on Noxos that was used in its construction. According to the Independent, it is estimated that at least 3,500 maritime voyages to transport between 7,000 and 10,000 tons of shining white marble. This indicated that the builders of the complex were already great mariners and shipbuilders. <laughs> the huge scale of the work required would suggest a powerful and unified state or league of smaller political entities. It is probable that the site was related to the first Hellenic state in history, the engineering complexity of organization, shipbuilding, and metalworking needed to achieve the building of such a place indicates that this civilization was already quite advanced by this time, indicating that the culture had existed and had been developing for hundreds of, year, uh, hundreds of years or more. The, this political entity was at least contemporaneous with and may have influenced the development of the Minoans in Crete and later <clears throat> the Mycenaeans. It appears that the Bronze Age complex was part of a wave of similar monumental buildings that occurred around the world at this time. This was a result of new technologies or the exchange of new ideas spread via trade routes. The pyramid shape of the islet would seem to indicate the influence of ancient Egypt, who associated this shape with their creator god. It is possible that the pyramid-shaped island represented, the early, represented to the early Greeks land rising from the primordial sea, a belief inspired by ancient Egyptian myth. Wait, are they saying that the Egyptian pyramids are represent their god? Yeah, what? primordial god. That's what it's saying. Well, okay. Yeah. Cool. The construction of the pyramid-shaped complex is arguably related to the importance that the Greeks attached to the mountains in their region, or, sorry, religion. For example, Mount Olympus was regarded as the home of Zeus and the other deities in their mythology. It is reasonable to assume that the idea that mountains were sacred may have originated in the Cyclades and indicate 
that the Aegean Islands played a decisive role in the religious development of the ancient Hellenic world. The Independent quotes Michael Boyd saying that the team's research, quote, suggests that these very early Greeks were organizationally, technically, and politically much more advanced than previously thought. This may indicate that the Cyclades Islands were possibly, possibly the cradle of Hellenic civilization. Their religious ideas, technology, and political organization may have influenced the Minoans and in turn the Greeks on the mainland. It seems likely that the Pyramid Island will continue to provide more insights into some of the earliest Hellenic societies. Pushing it back. Yep. And again, stuff keeps getting older. There's four comments. I read a Let's book these a saying. while back of, um, about Atlantis. You know, the guy was exploring the idea of Atlantis or the Atlanteans. <laughs> and he was... Uh, Sorry, I'm looking at the comments. Oh. Uh, he was uh, proposing that it was the, what, what's the name of the, uh, Mice. Mycenae? No, these people that they're saying that, uh, ah, just had the name, forgot it. Basically, Minoans? Early, yeah, Minoans, I think, because they had ships or whatever, and they went all over the place. Yeah. And he, you know, he looked into the, you know, the Michigan copper mines and all that. And there's, Right, but if these guys are doing metallurgy... Where were they getting the metal? Yeah. And it was Bronze Age. That's, the, yeah, claiming. that's what I'm talking about. So it's interesting. So you need copper and tin. Yep. One of the comments on here says, why is everything religious in the ancient world? <laughs> Not everything we ever do is religious. WTF. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a snake bro to yeah. me. <laughs> yep. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Last break. Last break. Ten by ten by ten, tangent cube of science, uttering syllables, <laughs> syllables, and maniacal giggles, maniacal giggling. Yeah. So enough about teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about fangs. <laughs> now I had a uh, uh, change subject here. Okay. I had a. A physics thought. All right. That I wanted, and you know, we may have kind of touched around the, the area of this idea before, but I wanted to get your thought on this. If relativity, the idea of you know space and time being connected in a way that. Um, Weird things happen with time if you're moving at ridiculous speeds or whatever. Yeah. Right? All that kind of stuff. Time dilation, etc. If the Big Bang idea is true and relativity is also true, how do we know how old the universe actually is? Because space would have had to expand out at such a ridiculous yeah. rate that by the time... Like, there's no way to know... That's inflation you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, there's there's no way to know how far or how long these... The, the It took the light from these distant objects in space to get to where we are, or the background yeah. radiation, if there's expansion, or if... Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like, I don't understand how these two ideas can coexist. Is my point. How can you have the Big Bang and also relativity at the same time and think that you have any idea how old anything is when you look out there? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, there, it seems like it would get, at least during the ex inflational period right after the Big Bang, that there would be a, that it should be a question mark because of that 
for sure. Yeah, and if if there was a central point to this explosion, on one side it's going that way, on the other side it's going the opposite direction, and there's all kinds of light and radiation radiating out everywhere, every every different direction, and we happen to be in some part of it later that's still got to be moving at some ridiculous speed. Yeah. And everything else is also moving at ridiculous speeds. <laughs> and space is also like what I, I don't know. You see what I'm saying? It's like yeah. how how do we know then when we look at a at a distant object like oh well you know it's exactly this far away. If right. the time because when that light started traveling the universe is much smaller. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know the answer to that question. I agree with you that it 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 has always seemed uh hard to put those two together. <clears throat> and I mean there's 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 parts of the inflational inflation theory that talk about how space had to move at far I mean it had to expand. It's not moving technically, but space is expanding at speed at, at a rate that would be equivalent to much greater than the speed of light itself. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm saying too, is that if if the Big Bang idea also is saying that space itself was part of the explosion, yeah. not just, it's like you have all the space and then all the Something stuff in the space. Into the space, yeah. All the stuff like is being compacted down like one giant black hole or something. Yeah. But all of the space of the universe is already there, just empty. Yeah, that would be I, one thing, but that's right. not really what they're saying. Right. That space was also created. Yeah. So the, how do we know? How, so what even was it? That's the other question. Well, I mean, before you even go there, I mean, come <laughs> on, guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what, what explodes and generates space by blowing up? Right. That too. <laughs> but let's just say that it happened. Just like, like what if we could make saying. a bomb that was a space bomb? <laughs> and when it blew up, it just made space right there. Man, I would clean my room with that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Use it on my house. Suddenly I have a 6,000 square foot house. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but yeah, if, the, if all of the space and the matter and the light and... All, all of the room, the space that the in which the light travels and all of these laws of physics take place, it seems like you can't have the same laws when during this like high concentration of all matter and, and space itself. Yeah. It, things have to be different. So, so then how can we actually say, oh, well, it's this old just based on the situation right now? Yeah. I don't, it just doesn't. Well, one, one thing that I've thought is that maybe, um, what was created was not space, but the proverbial ether that is the fabric of everything. Yeah. So space itself is something else, but what we think of what they, when they're talking about space time, they're actually talking about the, this, this quantum field or whatever it is. That is being fluctuated by stuff. That's what is generated and has a massive inflationary period. You can't have a universe without that quantum field there. So Yeah, you can't have stuff. And, and but they just associate quote unquote space with that quantum field and its own fluctuations. Okay, if that's what's going on, yeah. I'll have to, you know. Have to chew on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't wear your teeth down on it. <laughs> Back to teeth. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I've thought is like that that, that the, the equating of space with what is actually the quantum field. Yeah. And space time. And this is what maybe generates what we think of as relativity because you know, all these interactions with this field. And yeah, but still even to, to imagine that any of these quantum fields – being confined to the edges of something is weird. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, it's the residual energy of the explosion itself. Yeah, so like a magnetic field has the sort of inverse square law of attraction or, or yeah. 
repulsion or whatever it is, you know, so the further, but it, but it never actually completely goes away, right? You <laughs> yeah. just keep getting further away. It keeps getting lower and lower and lower. Yeah. Gravity is the same way. And yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Okay. The other thought that I was having that I, I was just enjoying, um, mystifying myself with <laughs> is the, the idea that all of the energy in the universe equals zero. Yeah. That there's, that basically there's, you have equilibrium, uh, everything at equilibrium would be zero energy. And then you, you disturb that equilibrium and you've got these polar opposite energies. Yeah. It's not necessarily negative energy or positive <laughs> energy. It's yeah. just, it's, it's the fact that there's not, it's not at equilibrium so that there's, you know, uh, an exchange. Yeah. So if you canceled out all of the polar inter- polarized energies in the universe, you would just have nothing. Zero. And that is freaking cool. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> that would be, <clears throat> that would work more towards a steady state too. Yeah. So whenever you hear, you know, these hippies like, oh, man, we need balance. It's like everything is already balanced. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you can do about that. That's right. <laughs> it cannot be imbalanced. There yeah, are... and the, I was thinking about, you know, they, they're, for a while there was a, the idea of maybe magnetic monopoles. If you could find some, if, if, if such a thing existed that it would be a very powerful object if you could find yeah. such a thing. Um, maybe were, maybe that's they, what entanglement is, is like on the quantum level, you know, one object being entangled with another is just... They're monopoles, yeah. yeah. But they're still connected somehow. They're connected through the, through the quantum fields, yeah. yeah. And the reason people thought that there might be magnetic monopoles is because gravity appears to be monopolar, at least where we are. Yeah, well... The electric universe people would be mad at you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so would the elastic universe people. <laughs> and that's us. <laughs> but still, so, you you know, we've talked about this before, the idea of symmetry. Like, why isn't there symmetry? There should be. There appears to be symmetry across all these other things. So why don't we see it on these other forces? Yeah. You know, so that right now the the universe we see in the standard model appears to be asymmetrical, and that doesn't make any sense. It's asymmetrical not only in the fact that gravity does not have a polar opposite, an anti gravity of a sort, but it's also asymmetrical in the sense that we know that antimatter is just as likely to be generated by some kind of big bang event as matter is. And if there was, if everything was symmetrical, then there should be no material at all because it all should have been, there should have been the same amount of antimatter as matter created in the Big Bang and they should have annihilated each other very early on and you result in nothing but radiant energy instead of any material. Yeah. And yet there seems to be a residual, a lar- you know, <coughs> large in the micro sense, but... Overall, you see what you see is like what we look out there and we see all these galaxies and stars, all that represents like less than 1% of the energy that was generated by the Big Bang explosion. And that's because a very tiny amount of matter, uh, or I'm say, I'm sorry, there was a very tiny amount more of matter than antimatter generated. And why is that? It's asymmetrical. So that leads to the idea that somewhere out there are entire sections of the universe that are actually made of antimatter. Yeah. But they would have to be very far separated from the matter parts or else there would be crazy interactions happening at the boundaries of those places. Right. And we don't see that. The other weird thing is that the that there's basically more energy in all the empty space out there than there is everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the dark energy stuff. <laughs> I love that too. Yeah. Yeah. But... You know, I don't, I, the whole dark matter, like they keep not finding it. Yeah. And at this point, people are just like, it's not going to be found. It doesn't exist. You know, I've seen this. Some pretty well known scientists are saying, like, okay, the search for dark matter has failed. Yeah. Like, in other words, implying that, that we don't know. Stop what, calling it matter. Yeah. 
We yeah, stop calling it else. that. It's we don't know what it is. We see the effect, but we don't know what it is, and yeah. and we've assumed that it's a gravitic effect caused by some kind of material, and we have not found it at all. Yeah, and we've made up entire particles, uh, classes, and groups, and thinking, well, this could be what they are. Let's look for this, and they don't exist, and they're not found. Yeah. So. The yeah, dark energy. That's why I love the idea that that matter is not the source of gravity. Right. You know, the collection, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and like the idea that dark energy is the anti-gravity that we're looking for, the polar opposite of gravity, but it only works on enormous structures. Yeah. And that's weird. But I also like the electric universe idea that gravity is the, is just another part of the electrical field. Yeah. Because it has both a an attraction and repulsion. Yeah, force. it just seems weird that it doesn't interact with the electrical field if it's part of it. it. Doesn't seem to there doesn't seem to be an effect there. You know, for a while, my problem with the electric universe was like I'm like, well, the electrical field has a polarity, and so it does equal zero across the universe. Yeah, and so you can't. You've got charge and charge. You can just count it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but if any any force that has a polar it, that is polarized will net zero over large structures because it's polarized, right? You're going to have a certain amount of <clears throat> positive. So, like on any object that has a magnetic field, it's got a north and south pole, and if right. you if you add up those two things, you get a zero. <laughs> now, the effect of that is it zero because you can be only being affected by the north side or the south side, depending on where you are around the object in relation to it, right? But the net effect, the net energetic effect of that magnetic field is zero. If you add up the, pol the, the North Pole and the South Pole and what they do, you end up with a zero. You end up with zero if you're com talking about their... Yeah, if you isolate it and it's only... <clears throat> yeah, if you're yeah. talking about within itself, it's, it's going to be a net zero. So gravity doesn't seem to do that. Yep. Your gravity doesn't have a pole. At least not in the in the three dimensions that we talk about, right? So magnetic poles, electro electromagnetic spectrum, the magnetic poles operate in the three dimensions. So I can go up here and be on the north side or I can go down here and be on the south side. But on that same object, anywhere I go, I'm on the, I'm being affected by one pole of the gravitic effect of it. See, that's why hollow earth makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> if you're on the inside of the earth. You're, you're stuck to the, <laughs> stuck yeah, to you're the stuck inside. to the inside wall. <laughs> that's sort All of the, the hollow earth people are standing upside down on the inside <laughs> of the wall, being shoved out. <laughs> and on the outside, we're all being pulled in. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, th th that's the question is why isn't there a pole to gravity? That's asymmetrical. Why is there more matter than antimatter? That's asymmetrical. Yep. <sighs> We're going to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> but is dark energy the pole of gravity? Is it the is it is it that the that in other words that unlike a regular just a three-dimensional magnetic pole where I can move to certain parts of the object and be affected by it. Gra gravity's pull is is across s size or scale, right? So on small scales, quote unquote small relatively, gravity is all pull. But once you get out to the large sizes, gravity is all push. And that's why everything's flying apart. Right. Uh, I like that. So that's the pull. Gravity is a pull goes across scale instead of space. Yeah. That's really cool. Now I'm going to have to work on a mechanism for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to start imagining, okay, if it's small, it's sucking things together. And <laughs> right. if it's large, it's, it's throwing it's, them apart. It's like throwing them apart, yeah. Now we're going to figure out how that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You solved it. Well, <laughs> I don't know, because dark energy seems to be a very large amount of the energy of the universe. Um, yeah, but this, it's the same deal. If, if, um, so dark matter, if you, if you add up all of the 
sort of gravitic energy with all of the matter that we see. Yeah. And then all the dark matter. You get a net zero. No, you add them all together. Uh. And then you take dark energy as the polar opposite. Oh, right. Yeah. Sorry, you said dark matter, not dark energy. Yeah. 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 Because dark matter is basically like they, they're seeing it's a gravitic gravitation. Effect. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't need the matter because it's not associated with that. Matter is being affected by it, obviously. Right. So if you take all the known matter gravity and then the plus dark, the dark, plus dark, the matter, dark matter gravity, gravity and add that all together, does it does it will it cancel out the dark, the dark energy, energy and you get a net zero? Yeah, and then you, symmetry. Then, then you might be on to something. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to count those things though. Yeah, yeah. They're all estimates. Yeah. And those estimates are based on the Copernican principle that everything is the same in every direction. Yeah. Generally speaking. <clears throat> like, what do you think about that? How do you end up with a Copernican principle in a in a giant explosion? Yeah, we must be in the middle. <laughs> right. <laughs> Seems like we should be in the middle if it worked out that way. Yeah, unless unless the whole idea of, you know, if it really is, if, if everything is accelerating away from everything else at an accelerating rate, then it, we would need to be in the middle before everywhere we look is the same because once you get a certain distance away, just we can't see it anymore because it's so red shifted. Oh, uh, yeah. It gets, you know, be, it's it so, gets in other beyond. words, the, the entire system is so big that it doesn't, that, that at a certain, like within the interior, to a certain degree, it wouldn't matter where you were, as long as you weren't very near the edge, yeah. right? Once you were inside, into the interior just far enough, then everywhere you look, it looks the same because everything's traveling away from everything What so does the fast. edge look like? It would just, well, I don't know, but I'm, I'm talking about in terms of light and, and radiation. Yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm so just wondering. So if, like, if you looked that way, it would just be darker. Yeah. Generally, because you're closer to the edge there. Yeah. In other words... Every you know, we look out so far. We have got the the cosmic microwave background or whatever, which is the quote unquote furthest yeah. thing. But it's the same in every direction. There's yeah. no, there's no more cosmic radio or background radiation in that direction. Yeah, because it's all red. Sh because everything's traveling away from everything else and accelerating. It's all red shifted out of. Yeah, it's never going to reach us. Right. From every direction. Whereas if we could detect all of it, we might say, okay, it's more concentrated over there and less concentrated over here. Perhaps. I, th I think that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. So we know basically that we're not close to the edge. <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. <clears throat> you know, another weird effect of, of uh, relativistic theory is is the idea that like if you were so if you were in a spaceship and you had a big let's say your spaceship was spherical and you just had a huge window on one part of it and your control area was right in the middle of the sphere so you're sitting in the middle of the sphere and you you got this whole hemisphere that's a window so you can see all the stars and you're out in space and you're sort of sitting still relative to whatever body you're nearby you're orbiting a star or something like that and you're looking out at space and you can see everything if you start accelerating in some direction and your ship is really powerful, and you get up to relativistic speeds, and you begin to approach the speed of light. As you're looking out your window, the universe will appear to begin to coalesce. It'll start to pull together. <clears throat> and then when you reach like an appreciable, like when you're up at 99, say, percent speed of light, you've reached that speed, and you're like really burning it. You know, you can't ever totally get to light speed. But you're up there where you're a real, now you're a relativistic object. The universe will be a single bright blob of gamma rays right in the middle of your view in the direction you're traveling. And it will be so such heavy radiation, even all the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is down in the radio, down in the radio spectrum will like get the frequency will go up and up and up as you move and it'll become hard radiation that's incredibly dangerous. Yeah. Everything in the universe will be look like that. It'll be this bright, it's be this like a giant welding light right yeah. in the middle. And it'll be deadly it's like the, in every possible way. Because of the Doppler effect, basically. As yeah. You, because you're going towards those wave those frequencies. Those yeah. Frequencies, they they get higher and higher frequency. And then if you you spun your just spun your ship on its axis to look behind you, you would see nothing. It would just right. be black. It'd be so because yeah. it would be so redshifted that there would be no 
no, almost no light whatsoever. But in the direction. But it would still be passing you at light speed. <laughs> it's just the wavelengths are so ridiculously it's long. Far apart. They, they, that you can't, you yeah. can't. They wouldn't even be. Right. They wouldn't be waving at all. But think about that. Just the regular light from the universe, you know, and there's a lot of hard radiation flying around in the universe. You know, the whole thing about there's a lot of deadly, deadly, deadly stuff flying around so, in the universe. But if you started moving at relativistic speeds, it would become incredibly, you, the shielding on your ship would have to be ridiculous. This is one of the reasons why the best way to travel in space is actually to just sort of sneak over to another dimension and do it there. Yeah. Because you don't want all that light burning you while you're trying to travel really fast. <laughs> So if you could just like slip out into some other or wrap a bubble of space around you that had no stars and other yeah. radiation in it. Yeah. That's how we, you know, we overcome uh, the same problem with air. Like this, the faster you go in air, the hotter it gets. Right. And, and you start burning slowly, up. Yeah. So, you so you just you go up above bubble. the air. Yeah. And you go really you wrap fast. Wrap a bubble of metal around you and go up above the air and you go really fast. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Yep, same principle. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's uh that's always seemed strange to me. That that I read a I probably have talked about this on the podcast before, but I read a science fiction story about a ship that couldn't s- slow down. Yeah, and it was hitting <laughs> it's hitting like yeah. entire galaxies and yeah. ringing the ship. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> oh, just passed through another galaxy. <laughs> But they were still only going lights. They were going just under light speed. But they had they, because they kept accelerating, the uh, the relativistic effect kept increasing. Now they'll never reach light speed, but because they can, could not stop accelerating at max acceleration, over time their 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 relativistic uh, dilation, the time dilation became so great that. To them, they were to them they galaxies. would pass through a whole galaxy like it was ringing a bell. Yeah. Whereas if you were outside watching the ship, it would just be burning through the galaxy at the speed of light. It would be some yeah. take, unstoppable take hundred thousand years to get across. Yeah, and it would just be some unstoppable enormous wave front of energy. Yeah. That would just destroy anything it passed through and wouldn't even notice it. But in the ship, it was just like bong. <laughs> like there's another <laughs> galaxy. Bong. God dang. <laughs> Dang yeah. it, Johnson, turn this thing off. <laughs> yeah. Can't you can't go out and fix the freaking engines because the radiation's so bad. So they couldn't they couldn't stop. Yeah. <laughs> they had to wait for the next big bang. Because <laughs> that 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 story went on the idea that the universe eventually stops expanding, expanding and then it all did the big crunch. Yeah. So they had to keep flying while that was happening. And everything is sort of like coming back together. And then they're like orbiting this enormous black hole at like ridiculous speeds. And then they watch it explode. And they're like, oh, God. And like ride the wave out there. <laughs> and colonize a planet in the new universe. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> but yeah, that part when they were, when they were trying to w- ride the explosion and, and inflation period... They had to switch out pilots every five minutes because it was, like, so stressful. <laughs> and they, the, the author just showed one part where the guy's he's actually, like, manually flying it because the computer can't handle it. And he's just like, ah! <laughs> and they're like, okay, swap him out. Somebody else sit down and fly the ship. And he's just like, oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's it. Yeah. One more in the can. Yep. Bunch of article reading. I had a, I had a few more, but that's okay. We can get to them some other time. Yeah, uh, I had to read that ridiculously long one about molars. That was really cool. <laughs> I dig all the teeth stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. You guys chew on that for a while. Just uh <laughs> It's a good it's a good article. <laughs> I liked how they were playing the two scientists back off of yeah. each other. Oh, Potts was not buying it. Yep. Show me the pot shirts. <laughs> He was not buying it. <laughs> you think they're 160,000 years old? Show me the pot shirts. My name is Dr. Potts. <laughs> yep. All right, you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Go to the website, brothers, do, brothers of the serpent.com. You can comment there, find the Snakeopedia and the glossary. Uh, and check out the snake skins. Yeah, snake skins. You can buy swag. Uh, I also, um, I really, I'm liking the, uh, the value for value system that's happening here. We've never really called it that, but 
I've recently found out that this is what it is called. <laughs> So what that also means is that you guys get like if you can't support us monetarily, you can support us in any other way you care to. So we have somebody, uh, Jordan, I think I read a couple of his comments on the last show over Twitter. He has now started us a Facebook page. Right. So there is now a Brothers of the Serpent Facebook page on Facebook. He is running it. I think the watcher watchers on Facebook every now and then. So he's probably going to be an admin there. So you guys can if you're on Facebook, find the Brothers of the Serpent page. It's brand new. He just started it. But join up. You guys can share shows, talk about snakes, <laughs> um, whatever you do on Facebook, whatever it is, whatever else it is you do on Facebook. So yeah, stuff thanks, like buddy. That, yeah, thanks so much, man. And stuff like that is is part of the the value for value. So you can donate. You can support the show. Uh, there is the Brothers of the Serpent Pyramid Scheme, the donate button right there on the website. You can also go to patreon.com forward slash Brothers of the Brothers of the Serpent, and I will put a link to that on the website at some point. I haven't, I just haven't done it yet. <clears throat> also, you, like Kyle said, you can go to the snakeskins, buy some sweat. There's just, you know, if you want to get stuff, stickers are cheap. You can get a whole bunch of stickers and they're pretty cheap. And you can just like slap them in bar restrooms and stuff, <laughs> so, you know, just tag the freaking toilets. Whap, brothers of the servant. <laughs> 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 just get a whole stack of them and take them wherever you go. You know, you see a, see a freaking traffic cone, whap, brothers of the servant. <laughs> <laughs> also follow us on twitter at snake bros with no vowels s-n-k-b-r-s uh and give us reviews you guys have been giving us a lot of reviews that really helps spread the show share the show and also share it wherever you can and now you can share it on facebook we got the facebook page so you can share that too and also thanks to history shift you can find him on twitter at history shift uh, he makes all of our videos for our YouTube channel, so you can go on YouTube and look up Brothers of the Serpent. We are there. We've got Brandon's got over a hundred of our shows on there, uh, and you can find him uh, on YouTube. Also, just look up History Shift on YouTube. He's got a bunch of interesting videos and a whole bunch of uh, playlists of cool videos about interesting stuff. And he's also got a blog about where he goes uh, looking for uh, glacial erratics and dolmens. And he's actually been there's kind of a cool story behind this. He uh, <clears throat> I turned him on to it because he he asked, you know, he was listening to the show and he was like, he sent me a message like, hey, uh, you said that, like, you know about weird places nearby people. Like, is there, is there any weird stuff I can go look at nearby me? And I, and I was like, yeah, there's a, uh, something in the gods, something or other park or whatever. And I, I knew it because I had seen this website about weird, ancient, quote unquote, dolmens or human constructions in, in his area. And he looked it up. He's like, oh, my God, that's like right next to where I live. Right. <laughs> and then he found out that there's been this woman who is not licensed to be a guide. And this is all in National Park area. Right. National Forest. There's a woman who is not licensed or anything like that who's been making people pay. to. She keeps all the locations secret and she gets people to pay her for her to take them out on these things and she fills them full of all this stuff about Atlantis and how these were built by Atlanteans using crystal technology and shit like that. Right. Wow. And it's totally illegal. She's basically doing something you have to you have to you have to get a, a guide license fee uh, license to do that stuff mm -hmm. from the national park system, and she didn't have that. So he's actually gotten her busted, and he's also propagating like he's putting up flyers with jump drives that have all the locations on on Google Earth, like a KMZ file that you can just plug into your computer and it shows you where they all are. He's trying to get it like people could just go to these places. You don't have to pay somebody. And he's gotten her busted now. She got caught because he saw her leading or he saw a group being let out. And he was like, holy shit, that's her. Right. And it actually turns out that she's making her teenage son do it. She's just sitting at home raking in the cash. What? Right. So he was actually like got video of him like sneaking behind him, following this group or whatever. And then he gets him. He calls the park service. He's like, yeah, I'm following him right now. And they come out there and bust him, dude. <laughs> so anyway. It's a great saga, and you can find and read about it on his blog, <laughs> historyshift.blogspot.com. It's a fantastic story. <clears throat> great Snake Bros, Snake Force work right there, buddy. <laughs> Making me proud, man. <laughs> and apparently she's gotten this huge, she's written this gigantic rant about it on her on her Facebook page, too. So the whole thing is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> What else we got? Henry? Yep. Henry Hablack. <clears throat> you can find him on Instagram, at H Hablack. He's a badass artist, does tattoo stuff. He's uh, sent us a whole bunch of stuff we got hanging up at the Tangent Cube here. Very mind-expanding images. 
looks very, uh, I don't know, like like rock art petroglyphy stuff. Very cool. You know? Reminds me of tarot. Yeah, tarot, yes. but also, I don't know, it looks like Australian rock art, too. Very detailed yeah. kind of things, but uh, very clean lines. Great artist and full of ancient symbolism and yes, yeah, mind mind exploding and ex expanding things. Love it. So you can find him at H Hablack on Instagram, and he's also got a website, Hermetica.BigCartel.com. <clears throat> Is that it? Um, Panels, acoustic paneling. Yeah, acoustic paneling solutions. Send an email to our buddy Kmart if you need fantastic acoustic panels for your podcast studio yeah. or your living room. Um, he makes uh, fantastic design, lightweight, beautiful construction. Send him an email, acousticpanelingsolutions at gmail.com and be like, Kmart, <laughs> I need panels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Snake Bros. Yeah. <laughs> also, Kyle makes all the music. Uh, you can find all uh, a bunch of his stuff on $50dynasty.net or .com. That's the name of his band. The music we use in this show, most of it is on SoundCloud, so you can find it there. Did you put a bunch of it up there or what? Yeah. The no. ones that I had, I put on SoundCloud, like, a long time ago. Oh, I talked, okay. to, I talked to you about it. Because people were oh, asking Oh, we need it. to stick some more up there then. Yeah. But the other thing I was going to say is, like... Some people have said, you know, oh, I want to make this, I want to write the song or whatever. It's, you know, do it. Send it to us. You know, or if you come up with like ideas for a little, because uh, we have, you know, we have our life. Uh, we, we got our little soundboard here. If you come up with any like sound effects you think we could have, or you know, you just want to shout snakes, we could put it on the sound in the sound <laughs> cue, man. This is the value for value system. Send us stuff. Send us jingles. Yeah, we Great. do have a uh, a new um, mailing address. Or one up boxes. Oh, yeah. So let us send us an email. You want to send us stuff through snail mail. <laughs> yeah. Send me a letter. Yeah. You want to send us swag? You can. We have a P.O. box now, so get a hold of us on email and I'll give it to you. I'm not going to dox us by it through a P.O. box. I don't want weird shit to start showing up. <laughs> I mean, I do, but only from people who ask for the, for the address through email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's it. I want to thank everybody for your support and for listening to the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I'm going to find a rabbit hole soon. <laughs> Kyle is going to find a rabbit hole. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I've got a couple of books I'm looking at to rabbit hole down. We've got some guests coming up, too. And I think Soraya has asked us to do some more stuff with him, so... That should be happening. Yeah. All right. That's it. That's a wrap. In the can. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. <laughs>